And I think at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. McGovern. Um, thank you, and uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I don't get a chance to speak uh, much about railroading, uh, except for my fellow railroaders. I'd, I'd like to start out a little bit tonight with the uh, uh, the BNSF and the, the ore line that uh, we call the Big Wind South of here. Uh, the, at the building of the uh, foreign line, uh, the BN, uh, we were still the BN, Burlington Northern Railroad, and uh, that was part of the other CB and Q Railroad. The uh, Orange Line is made up of a 128-mile section of track running east and west timetable-wise, and where everybody else would be actually north and south of the track runs from a point uh, 10 miles east of Gillette to a point 20 miles east of Douglas, Wyoming. It was officially opened in October of 1979 when the first coal train ran across it there. Uh, at this time, the Oran consisted of a, a single main line with sidings located about every 20 miles. And these sidings would uh, usually accommodate uh, two uh, coal trains, and uh, that would be made up of five DC locomotives or engines and maybe 115 cars uh, with a tonnage that pushed a maximum of 15,000 tons. Uh, the method of operation that uh, we used for movement of trains at that time was what we referred to as dark territory. And what that meant was that uh, you would receive train orders that give you authority to move on the main line. Uh, you would receive your orders, uh, say, here in Gillette or in Guernsey, then uh, you would be able to receive additional orders and new orders at the, uh, at the uh, stations where the operators operated out of, and that was about every 20, 30 miles on the way. Uh, the orders would, give, would be given to the operator by radio to the uh, dispatcher's office in Lyons, Nebraska. Uh, these orders were written up on what we had called uh, onion skin paper. There was a thin paper that the operator would use, and uh, she would either hoop them up to you or you'd stop, and if you had to meet there at that site, you'd stop and pick up your orders then. At the time, uh, there was about five coal, uh, coal mines located on the Warren line that, uh, that was actually loading coal from these trains. Uh, today, now we have three to four main lines that we use the method of operation is CTC, Centralized Traffic Control, whereas movements are all uh, controlled by signal power switches. Uh, the switches are and the, the control is uh, by a dispatcher in Fort Worth, Texas. The trains now consist of three to four AC locomotives or engines with a, a hundred, up to 115 cars, 50 cars, excuse me, for 20,000 tons of gross weight. Uh, today, now there are 10 coal mines that work for uh, loading the trains on the south line. And we average about 50, 60 trains a day. Uh, and since this is kind of an exhibit about producers, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit uh, about the producers. Uh, before the boost, uh, what was sometimes called the uh, crummy or the way car was phased out. The standard train crew consisted of four or five people. Uh, on the head end, the lead old locomotive would have been the engineer, sometimes the fireman, and the head brakeman. And the conductor and the rear brakeman was on the rear of the train, of course. Rear duty was actually the safety of the train, the watching and protection of the rear of the train winding back switches, observing the train on curve to make sure there's no sparks, fires or smoke coming out of the wheels, bearings there, but the real uh, roller bearing, and, uh, and watch for any type of derailments that, was, that you could see from the rear. Uh, the train, uh, if they couldn't make track speed, uh, the duty of the rear end was, like I said, to protect the train. And, what we, at the time, we put down what they <coughs> call torpedoes or guns. And it was really an explosive device that uh, would warn the train behind you to, to reduce your speed and watch out for something, for obstruction ahead of you. And this was by <coughs> slowing down so the rear brakeman could get off and uh, he would put the uh, torpedoes down on the, on the rail <coughs> on the engineer's side, which would signal that train crew to slow down. Uh, sometimes if you was going to slow down and pick up orders or, or you couldn't make track speed, you could also throw a QC out. And that would be a 10-minute uh, 
QC, you're told not to coordinate with your speed, and that would tell the train behind you that they'd have to stop and proceed after 10 minutes, and that would keep a 10 minute interval between trains there and keep your distance between them, protect each other there. Uh, then if, uh, say, uh, you had to do work or you had to stop and switch or your train broke in two, you would, uh, once you stopped, the flagman would go out to describe the, the uh, timetable distance. In, in this area, the Powder River is always two miles. He'd go out two miles and uh, set a uh, torpedoes out and turn one half the distance. And he would wait to be recalled from the engine or uh, the, the train coming up behind him to pick him up and bring him up to the boost. And uh, there again, that was just the protection of the rear of the train. And uh, today, the boosts are replaced by signals, track detectors, and rear end devices, brakes, brakes as we call them. And uh, it's all electronic and sends the air pressure and all the pertinent information for the locomotive to the head end with the engineer and the conductor now right. Sometimes a brakeman, depending on the type of train you have. And I guess a little personal note on the boost there that what I missed about it the most now was the cooking back there. He was a, a good uh, cook, conductor, a brakeman. He was always, everybody always wanted to work with him. If he wasn't, he was pretty low down on the list. <laughs> that was one thing I, I missed about the boost and working on it was the meals where I just got cooked back there. Doing the rear brakeman, so. And uh, thank you for coming out and hearing me tonight.